In this episode, I am going to be reviewing Double Indemnity from 1944. This was directed by Billy Wilder. He also co-adapted the screenplay with Raymond Chandler. The book is by James M. Kane. His novel is called Three of a Kind, and it starred Fred McMurray, Barbara Stanwyck, and Edward G. Robinson. This certainly isn't considered the first film noir, but it's certainly uh, set a trend in Hollywood for its box office success, and it laid a foundation for so many of the themes in film noir to come. For example, we have guilt, we have the themes around morals, betrayal, greed, paranoia, anxiety, crime, things like that. So to me, this film is, is... Not so much about how people think it's, you know, you've got your femme fatale, you got your doom protagonist, and that the femme fatale gets the doom protagonist to kill her husband in order to get the insurance money so that they can be together. And that's obviously part of a con. That's certainly true. And that the guy that Fred McMurray plays very much is in love with the woman. He's willing to kill her husband to take the insurance money, but he's really doing it because he's so infatuated and in love with Barbara Stanwyck. Now, often that is what people think this film is about, but it's actually a little more complex than that because what's so interesting about Fred McMurray is we see off the top, uh, he's shot in the arm. We don't know exactly what happened. He goes to his office and he's telling the story into a recorder for Edwin G. Robertson's character. So everything is told in the past through his point of view. And as he says in the top, I did it for the love of a woman and for money. And I didn't get the woman and I didn't get the money. So we know he's doomed. We know everything went went wrong and we ask ourselves why. But but really what's interesting is is that he's not totally doing this for her. As when he meets her off the top, we see that he's, you know, very sexually attracted to her. That great shot, you know, the POV shot when he first sees her as he visits the house because he's trying to renew her husband's automobile insurance package. And, you know, she's only in a towel. And as she's going down the stairs, he's looking at her leg and he's the anklet bracelet. Uh, And, you know, it's filled with heat and you can really feel it between them. It's very wonderfully performed by Barbara Stanwyck and and Fred McMurray. So what's interesting is is that when she makes the suggestion a, a little later on to get a accident insurance so that if something happens to him she'll you know then she'll get the uh she'll get the insurance money. She 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 makes it seem that she wants it just because she was so concerned about her husband working in the oil industry he's in in dangerous conditions and she's concerned that something will happen to him and he doesn't have accident insurance and he sees right through that he's seen you know he's been around for a while he's seen every trick in the book about what people try to do to con the insurance company and we even see that earlier in the first scene with Edward G Robinson there's someone come comes in puts in some kind of uh, claim and Edward G Robinson being so good at what he does sees right through the con and and you get a good sense that Edward G. Robinson is a guy who just knows the ins and outs of what people, when they're legitimate claims and when they're not. And he, you know, Fred McMurray right away says, you won't get away with that. There's no way you'll get away with that. She kind of backpedals and he storms out because he's repulsed by it. But what's interesting is that then he starts to think about it. He's And he's sort of as he's, you know, this film is also about, those sometimes how people we have these really dark impulses that we don't follow and in this film they certainly Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck's character certainly follow their darker darker impulses we start to see that this is actually something he does want to do and he can't quite believe it that's something part of his subconscious that has now come to the conscious part of his of himself and he even goes home and he has a hard time uh, putting on the lights as, as it starts to get dark outside which I really I like that touch as he's looking out the window because he can't believe that he actually is now thinking about this and as he realizes he's actually thought about this for years and he has to, in the voiceover the voiceover is so great in this because it says so much about about the psychology of this man, what he's thinking and feeling through every step of the way. And of course, in many film noirs, they utilize voiceover so, so well. And as he says, you know, it's like the guy who's, 
you know, worked behind the roulette table in a casino, I'm paraphrasing, in a casino or something, and he sees how everybody tries to cheat and he knows how everybody's tricks. And so he starts to think of, hmm, I know this system so well that I can probably get away with cheating the system. And as an insurance man, he knows the system so well. How could I get away with fraud? And so this is something that really intrigues him. Uh, so it's it's really more about, uh, about that as opposed to love. I mean, lust and love certainly is a part of it. I mean, you can, as I said, the scenes, you know, the, the great dialogue by Wilder and Chandler is so great. Uh, you know, how they got around the production co- code. It's like poetic in the hard-boiled uh, sense. And it's like, it's just beautifully written. For example, uh, when when he she talks about, and he openly flirts with her, you know, from the beginning. And when she talks, he goes, well, how fast do you think I've been going? And she goes, he go, what, about a 45? He goes, I think you're going about a 90. <laughs> you know, I just think that was so, so great to basically... Uh, talk openly about how much he's coming on to her, how much, you know, he can't stop looking at her legs. He can't stop talking about her anchor bracelet. So she certainly does drive him crazy, but it's not simply the, you know, cliche of, well, he's around, he's, he's doing this all for her. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen this movie in a while and that's how I remember it. And it goes so much deeper than that. It's so much more interesting, but he certainly has more of a conscious as opposed to Barbara Stanwyck, What's interesting is about the fact that it's told from her, his point of view, is that you see early on, she seems to have doubts. Uh, She's, you know, she goes to his apartment, talks about how her husband hits her and, uh, you know, that he's he's not leaving any of his insurance money to her. If anything happens, it's going to her daughter. And so he he, he doesn't have as much money as he used to. Uh, but then, you know, she also, you know, cries and talks about how he's uh, abusive and how he hates her and he treats her so, so badly. And so you you wonder whether she's lying or not, but she's very, very convincing about it. And of course, towards the end, you do know that, you know, anytime she showed some sign of some kind of humanity, some way in which the audience can empath- empathize with her, that it was all of a lie. She was using Fred McMurray to to get the money and also get rid of him. I mean, she didn't love him. This was not a way to divorce and be with Fred McMurray. It was a way to get all the all of the money, which she ultimately admits. But throughout the film, you're not so so sure. And again, because it's all told through Fred McMurray. And yet he may be sure, but that's just what he thinks. But certainly at the end, we know it's true. There's another real real clue to how cold she is, is the fact that after they kill her husband, they strangle him. uh, And then that whole setup where he goes on the train, pretends that that he's her husband and jumps off to make it look like the guy fell off and broke his neck. Uh, He says that she was, you know, he was shaking and that she was calm you know that she wasn't shaking at all and so you you get a clue that she's this is there's no emotion there's she has no feeling she has no uh you know moral compass so to speak and of course as the film goes on you know he feels so bad about the daughter i mean he met the daughter uh, earlier and he gives her a ride you know she waits in his car and she he gives her a ride to meet her boyfriend and you know you start to see even before they did anything that he's thinking to myself my god how am i driving with the the daughter of this man i mean this is terrible what i'm doing and she's such a nice young woman and you 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 get the sense that his guilt starts to eat away at him even before they commit the murder Now, what's interesting about the relationship with Edward G. Robinson is that they have this great friendship. And this is something that apparently was not in the book as much. And a bit of trivia is that the writer of the book, uh, James M. Cain, felt that they, uh, Chandler and Wilder actually made the story better and more interesting than, than the book. And that was something that was not in the book as much. And it makes it far more interesting because, you know, Edward G. Robinson wants Fred McMurray to work with him more. He wants him to be his assistant and they're really, really good friends. And as you know, again, this is where the, 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 a bit of the dark humor comes in is that, you know, Edward G. Robinson is a guy who says that he knows in the pit of his, of his stomach, when any of these claims that there's something off about this, but this one, he can't tell anything that's off about it. He thinks that the guy certainly fell off the train 
and he thinks that there's there's nothing more to it. He and that we and you know he took out accident insurance two weeks before. It was just a bad break for the insurance company. And what's interesting is that the guy, their superior, thinks tries to make Barbara Stan would think that it's a suicide just because he doesn't want to pay out. You know, classic insurance company. Uh, so everybody is, you know, everybody has their 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 share of flaws and lack of heart. But you know, Edward G. Robinson then begins to just figure it out. You know, he's like, well, I bet you this is what happened. I bet you someone. J- went it disguised himself as you know the man as uh, the husband and and made it look like he fell off the train but but really they killed him first so he he sort of guy is so smart but how are you going to prove that and the of course the irony is is that he's talking to the murderer and the murderer is a close friend of his and as he says how are you going to prove that so of course they begin to watch stanwick day and night he tells stanwick you know we can't be seen together if they they're going to suspect me if we're seen together we're going to have to keep apart where the anxiety really comes in is after they kill the husband every time he goes to work he talks about in the voice over how nervous he was how his hands were shaky how he had to wear darker sunglasses uh just so people wouldn't see any kind of fear in his eyes or suspect that that's that was really beautifully done done because anxiety is hard to portray really sometimes and i think they did it and it's done very well in film nor and it's done beautifully in in this film and it eats away at him what he's doing to edward g robinson too because now edward g robinson starts to think that it's their daughter's boyfriend uh, who who is having is had something to do with it because he's been going to the house and then he hears uh, he sneaks into Edward G. Robinson, hears the recording of how great Fred, Mc, Fred McMurray is and how he, he couldn't have had anything to do with it for, because uh, the insurance company begins to suspect him. You're not really sure why they, they suspected him at that point. Uh, but he says, no, no, there's nothing he did. You know, he's a great, great at what he does. He's a good friend of mine. Everyone, you know, his where he was that night has been checked. And it's certainly the uh, the daughter's boyfriend who because he's been visiting Stanwick every single night so they wanted to pursue that and this is really where Fred you know Fred McMurray starts his character starts to really it, it becomes all all too much and and everything just starts to crack and he knew he couldn't he couldn't live with the 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 daughter's boyfriend getting blamed you know, the daughter now had her uh, mother die and her father die, and he could not do this. I mean, he just, his consciousness comes in and and his morals begin to be addressed. And, and he, I think he starts to ask himself, who am I? Uh, there's And there's another great scene where his daughter, te- you know, he, he begins to hang out with the daughter mainly because she starts to think that Stanwick had something to do with it because – she was convinced that Stanwyck killed her mother, which likely was true, as she tells the story. And you see, as Fred McMurray is now learning more about Stanwyck, his feelings about her are changing. And now he knows what happened to um, the first wife of, of Barbara Stanwyck's husband. Uh, you know, all she said earlier was that she was his nurse. But, you know, McMurray knows nothing about the fact that Stanwyck clearly killed this woman. The daughter's boyfriend, he has been going over there every single night. So the audience at this point is led to believe as he heads over to Barbara Stanwyck's place that he is going to kill her because uh, he thinks that she's involved with their her stepdaughter's boyfriend. So this is an interesting scene because you, you, you know, as you know, Stanwyck has already been caught in some lies. So. Fred McMurray doesn't know what to believe. And as she says, no, it had nothing. You know, I was trying to get him to kill her, you know. So she she was feeding his mind with the fact that, you know, the daughter was having an affairs. And because he was such a jealous guy, she knew that about him. And so she was trying to put him into some kind of violent rage. And there's no reason for her to do that uh, other than spite, other than the fact that she hated the daughter. Uh, There was no money involved in that. And that was another aspect to how Fred McMurray was disturbed uh, by her. Because again, he didn't know anything about that. He didn't know anything about how the first wife died, which clearly Stanwyck was the, the catalyst for. 
And this is all just becoming way, way too much. And so, you know, as he goes to pull to pull the curtains, because he's obviously going to kill her, and then she shoots him. She couldn't finish him off because she realizes in that moment that she actually loves him. Uh, you know, again, that's it's it's melodramatic. It's a little out there, but you you believe it because I mean, Stanwick was so genuine in that moment. I mean, what a performance! Suddenly seeing this woman who has been so, so cold-blooded, suddenly so tender and vulnerable, and she says, I know I just realized now that I, the reason I can't kill you is because I do love you, and he doesn't buy it, but I don't even, and he does and he shoots her, but I don't even think even if he did buy it, it would matter. This is really up to the audience, because to me, he was so disturbed by everything that she had done, and everything that he had done, because they were now thinking that the daughter's boyfriend was behind this, he was not going to let that go to court and have that be the new situation and have the daughter have to go through that after now losing her mother and her father. So it's a double suicide in that sense because he knows he's going to confess his part in it and go to the gas chambers and kill her. I think the only reason he doesn't kill himself is because he wants to tell Edward G. Robinson the truth so that he that Edward G. Robinson doesn't try to pursue the daughter's boyfriend. And, you know, as soon as he shot and he shoots Stanwick, the daughter's boyfriend shows up and he says to her, go see, go see the, the daughter because she really, 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 really loves you. And so that was like his last good deed before, of course, the inevitable doom of what's to come. And I love when, you know, he's telling the the story through the tape recorder. Edward G. Robinson shows up. He know now knows the truth about what's happened, that it was actually Fred McMurray all along. And just the look in his face, he doesn't really know what to do. It was beautifully performed uh, because, you know, Fred McMurray still, there's a part of him that wants to run. And as he says, he's going to cross the border, go to Mexico. And Edward G. Roberts says, you're not going to make it. And sure enough, he doesn't even get to the elevator before he collapses. And of course, that classic last, you know, moment of lighting the cigarette and the whole film, it was always uh, Fred McMurray lighting, you know, sort of, sort of the surrogate father, Edward G. Robbins cigarette. Um, you, you do, it's interesting how you do feel for, for Fred McMurray. You just feel that he, where he went wrong. He made some bad, bad choices. He certainly was rotten. You know, there's a great line that Barbara Stanwyck says that she's rotten. And he says, well, so am I just not as bad as you. <laughs> so, there was a certain humor that uh, throughout the film that worked really beautifully. I think a lot of that is owed to the writers. Of course, Wilder is known for his great humor and, and also just the performers because the interesting thing about the casting is that Stanwyck and Fred McMurray at this point were never known to play any kind of a criminal. They were known to play people struggling with different situations and uh, and could be funny. And they brought, because they had that sarcastic flair, uh, it worked so well with that great hard-boiled uh, dialogue. They both had the right amount of charm and seduction, but also uh, showed a different side to be very, very cold, cold-blooded. But you do feel sorry for Fred McMurray because, as I said, he just made – he went down a rabbit hole and he followed some of his darker impulses that he should have He should have known better. So it's a, it's a wonderful, really wonderful film. I think I really have only seen it once or twice max before. I really don't know why it wasn't a film that I was, wasn't as fond of as other film noirs, but I can see this is a film – that I can see certainly why it is considered uh, one of the best ones because it's just so fantastic. A couple of trivia notes is that uh, Chandler and Billy Wilder hated each other. They did not get along at all, but somehow they managed to come together and write this really, really wonderful, wonderful screenplay. Something I was not aware of is that there are were a couple of alternate endings shot to this film one was the gas chamber scene where we ac they actually saw Frederick Murray put to death. And that, I believe, no one's 100% sure, but it may have been shot or written just to, you know, so that the censors knew that, yes, you know, this man does not get away with anything. 
Clearly, at the end, he doesn't. I mean, you don't see him go to the gas chamber, but you know he's going to be arrested. But they did shoot it, and there's only a still here from this uh, film noir book. I'll put that a little closer to the camera. It's a nice shot, though. Um, this still here, this is from the book, the film noir book, Into the Dark. So there is a still that exists, but people have tried to find the footage over years, and and it's largely believed to be you know, burnt <laughs> or tossed aside. Uh, but I'm really glad they didn't stick to that ending because I think the fact that it ended with Robinson lighting the cigarette of Fred McMurray is just perfect. Just such a great ending. And of course, the photography is is quintessential noir with the dark lighting, the use of shadows and the great visual motifs. I mean, the it, you know, those Venetian blinds are everywhere in this film. And the one it stood out to me the most was when you first see Fred McMurray go to Barbara Stanwyck's house and the maid first asks him to wait in the living room. As soon as he enters the living room, there's Venetian blinds all over him. And to me, that really showed how well, you're trapped. You're tra <laughs> you got in here and boom, we, we you're trapped now in a cage and you're about to find out why. The cinematography was by John F. Seats and it's beautifully, beautifully shot. I want to thank all of my Patreon members. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, go to patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. And if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head right here to your top left in just a second. Just click on that. And then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new videos or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.